here's the thing. The shift to distant learning this spring has been a real challenge for all students, but it was especially difficult for students with special needs. In a recent survey, many parents of special needs children reported they aren't getting the support and services they need. As we wait to find out what fall will look like for Minnesota students, Dan Morgan, president of Groves Academy, joins us on the Centerpoint Energy Home Service Plus hotline to discuss how parents can advocate for their students with special needs. Welcome to WCCO Radio, President Dan Morgan. How are you? Carolyn, I'm doing great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. How are you? Hope your family is doing well. Doing well, just hanging in there. Tell us a little bit about Groves Academy. Well, Groves is really an incredible organization, and I feel very lucky to uh, have joined them back in January. And uh, Groves has a mission and vision to provide transformative learning experiences to all learners. And at Groves specifically, we see students who are unique learners, meaning that they need a different approach to teaching. Uh, Often they are diagnosed with dyslexia or ADD or ADHD. Uh, They may have executive function challenges, which means that they have uh, difficulties with planning and execution and completion of work and time management and so on. Uh, And Groves is an organization with three different divisions that are dedicated to that. So we have our school, and many in Minneapolis will have heard of Groves Academy. Uh, We're in St. Louis Park and has has been a school for students like this in uh, first grade to 12th grade. For 47 years, Groves has been around. Uh, But we also have a learning center, which provides diagnostic assessment and evaluation, sort of that deep testing and understanding to really get at who is this child uniquely, what are their individual issues, and how can we support them. We also do tutoring and speech and language, and we have a summer program. Uh, And then we also have our third component, which is really unique uh, in the world of education, in, in my opinion, in that we take What we know works really well in our school in terms of teaching reading and teaching literacy and sort of the art that goes into that, we combine that with uh, 50 years of science that has gone into literacy research and understanding how humans being learn to read. And we take that all and we bring that out to schools in the community, in the Twin Cities community. So we now work in over 30 schools uh, in the area and are looking to to bring that up to almost 50 schools for next year. So it's those three organizations all together that allow us to serve students with special needs uh, and some of these learning challenges, both within our school and across the city. You know, social dis- I'm sorry, distance learning has made it very difficult for parents all over this country. Um, and yeah. I wonder how difficult it has been for students with special needs. You know, it's... <laughs> I have to say that this spring, uh, when COVID hit, it was it really sort of turned education on its head uh, in almost every facet, and it certainly affected students with learning challenges, uh, perhaps even more so, uh, partially because what happened was is that they had to shift their relationship with their school and with their teacher. And there's a few really key components that I believe parents can think about and advocate for as they're, as they're looking to next year and things that they can really support their kids with. And one of those really is those relationships. When you took students and teachers away from each other, uh, it made it really challenging to maintain the trust that they had, uh, both uh, personally and within the teaching structure that they had. And it also affected the consistency of delivery of school. Uh, you know, it's really important for kids who learn differently to have consistency in their life and certainly consistency in their education. Just even knowing what's going to happen on Monday at, at 9 a.m., what's going to happen on Tuesday at 9 a.m., what are they going to be learning and how are they going to be learning, it's really important that those things are in place. And this spring, all, again, all of that got turned over. Uh, and then a third component that's also really important is really just the idea of what's called multi-sensory teaching, which is targeting the different senses that we use to learn in different ways. Uh, And so giving kids what are called manipulative, things to hold in their hand, that was more difficult uh, when you go to distance learning. Uh, At Groves, we were able to put packages of of work together for kids to take home, uh, and our teachers did amazing work in getting that uh, all ready to go for parents, and so they were able to provide some of that. But I know that that was a challenge across the board for all schools. And, and schools did the best that they could uh, and are preparing now for the fall to do things differently. But those three things were really impacted, I think, uh, as kids were pulled away from the school and had to sit in front of a screen all day. 
You know, my daughter lives in Boston with my two grandchildren and my son-in-law. And I have to tell you, my seven-year-old granddaughter asked the question. Uh, she said, I don't think I can be a child anymore. I don't have the experiences of having friends, sitting next to people, playing, talking, engaging with them. In other words, the culture of school is changing. How difficult is that change in culture uh, has it been for Groves Academy? Wow, well, <laughs> your granddaughter sounds very mature. I totally understand what she's saying. Uh, you know, and that was, again, something that was, I talk about the relationship. That is one of those things that really change. And it's not just relationship with the students and their teachers, although obviously that's incredibly important for the progression of their education, but the students with each other. Uh, and it is difficult to maintain friendships and to maintain those social relationships and their social emotional health, which is an important part of the school experience when you have to shift to 100% distance learning. One of the things that we did at, at Groves, and I know a lot of other schools tried to do this as well, was to have specific time dedicated to social interaction, at least, you know, in a distance learning platform. So we would have kids get uh, online, and, and we used the Zoom platform, and they would have lunch together a couple of times a week while they were on Zoom. Uh, and it was really great uh, to see that. We had opportunities for kids to do projects together where they would they would be able to work together via the distance learning model using different platforms uh, where they were able to both access work at the same time and then they could partner up with different students to do that kind of thing. But I will tell you that that is one of the things that we learned and by the way that we heard from families is going to be critically important as we look to how we structure school for next year is to make sure that we include as many social opportunities as we can if there's a distance learning scenario uh, as well as making sure that we pay attention to social, emotional health and mental health. Uh, and those are things that we're going to be looking for as we plan for next year. You mentioned the word relationships, and I know um, from working, I've been involved in a couple of your galas over the years. And I oh, great. tell you, you know, I know about the relationships and how important it is to partner with the right ones to make sure that those students get what they need. So advocating for students is often placed in the parents' hands, but Grove supports um, by partnering the teachers with the parents as well. Is this enough or are there other partnerships to consider? Are there other partnerships that are important? That are important and to consider that maybe you haven't looked at that you are looking down the road at because this is a whole new time. And so relationships that we might have already had, like with the teachers and, and parents with the teachers and so much more, there may be outside partnerships that you are looking at now that will help support this whole distancing learning. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and that, that it is very true. You know, obviously, again, the relationship between teacher and student, between teacher and parent is really important. We're also recognizing now in a distance learning environment how important it is to pay attention to the parent and student relationship because parents are asked to do a little bit more sometimes when it comes to distance learning. Sometimes there's just technology help that they have to, that they have to work on with students. They may have something that they need to learn on their own. So that also makes it important for us as an organization uh, and as educators to perhaps seek some outside expertise in the technology piece, for example. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing at Groves, uh, and I know that just educators across the board are doing because I see them, are there are so many webinars that are happening right now in training in different components that will have a positive impact on distance learning training in the technology piece, for example, or training in how to support uh, mental health by a distance learning approach, uh, training in how to develop parent re parent groups. So sort of these relationships parent to parent is also really important as well. And I encourage people to get involved in those and to seek out some of those resources because it will really be beneficial uh, if we're back into a full distance learning model. With all the distance learning that is going on across the great state of Minnesota, of course, tools are the most important thing that, you know, do we have the right tools in the hands of the students, in the hands of the teachers? Um, what did you do? How did you decide what tools were necessary for this to be successful? Well, look, I have to say, and I know pretty much every school went through the same thing. Uh, we had to decide very quickly uh, in the spring what was going to be the best approach. And, you know, the good news is, is there really are so many uh, tools out there uh, to, that are made available, uh, just widely speaking in the business world or in school as well, to be able to deliver uh, a virtual education. Things like doing video conferencing, uh, there are uh, products out there where 
you can put work onto uh, sort of a, you know, a virtual drive, for example, that everybody can access. And then you use what are called synchronous or asynchronous instruction. So synchronous instruction is when you're doing a video conference and you sort of live either one-to-one or with your classroom and you're teaching and teachers are teaching directly to students. And then the asynchronous part is where they might create a lesson plan or they might record themselves giving a lesson and the students will watch it or access the work in a different way. And then they will come back to the synchronous model, which is where they'll talk to their teacher and they'll review what the work that they've done and so on. So we had to just figure out what would be the right combination of uh, the synchronous work and the asynchronous work and then the tools that we were going to need to use. And then we had to do a lot of training. Uh, and so we, I was impressed that, you know, at Groves, our teachers rallied together. And again, I know this is true across the board educationally, uh, where we sat down and we trained everybody in the tools that we were going to use uh, and then gave them the support they needed through the spring. And I'll tell you, you know, it wasn't perfect. Uh, there certainly were some challenges along the way. Uh, but we took away a lot of really great information on how we can make adjustments for the coming year uh, as we think about what distance learning might look like for us at Groves uh, as we get to the fall. I'm so glad that you said it's not perfect because it hasn't been perfect for anyone. <laughs> you no. know, all the schools Absolutely. that are rolling this out, it's been difficult. It's been a challenge. So I really wish you well with this. I'm sure that there are people listening today that are going, oh, who is Groves Academy? Where are they located? You can see them right off of Highway 100 if you're traveling south. It's right to your right. Um, and you've been in business for how many years again? Groves Academy is a school for 47 years. Uh, so we're excited for our 50th anniversary in a few years. And our Learning That's Center and our crazy. Growth Literacy Partnerships have been functioning for, uh, you know, over seven years right now. So the whole organization is, is very mature uh, and has a, a ton of great expertise. All right. So where do they go if they want more information? Uh, well, the quickest thing to do uh, in our virtual world is go to our website, which is grovesacademy.org. Uh, as a nonprofit organization, we are the .org part. Uh, and there is just a wealth of information and knowledge on the website. That's how you can get in contact with us. And we're here to answer as many questions and as be, be as supportive as we possibly can. We might not have all the answers for every single student, uh, but we want to be able to be there as a support for you and help guide you in the right place uh, if Groves uh, can't help you with your particular challenge. It's been a pleasure having you on, President Morgan. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Geraldine. I hope you have a great day. All right, you too, sir. My goodness, don't get, don't forget to go to Groves with an S Academy dot org and learn as much as you can. You'd be surprised; they really have a great program.